There you go. In case there's anyone who's not here who wants to watch it later. So um, we had finished up with the Lord's Prayer back in November, and now we're looking at the actual receiving of Holy Communion itself. In these next few pages, you can actually see there's a lot more red print than there is black. These are just instructions, mm -hmm. and there are many, many options. So you probably already know the manner in which communion is distributed has almost infinite variations. Um, there are various local customs. There are perceived time constraints. Um, there's various liturgical piety. All of this varies, and there's almost nothing in these pages that is specifically prescribed. So the first instruction after the Lord's Prayer is the presiding minister may welcome people to communion with one of these two sentences. Taste and see that the Lord is good, which I think Pastor Greg does say, if I remember his words, or come to the banquet for all is now ready. Or at grace, has the net says something like, That's nice. the communion assistants may now come forward. So, <laughs> so there are lots of different things that can go on right there. Um, the bread, it says next, the bread may be broken for the communion. If you're um, using one large loaf of bread, then perhaps at this time it's broken up into small pieces. Um, but then you can see that the words that are said when they are given to the people are actually, there's no may here. This is one um, that Martin Luther himself thought was particularly important. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And for, for Martin Luther, that's very important that people recognize this holy sacrament as being something specifically for them. Um, there are words out there here and there, but the book really strongly suggests that we stick with that wording um, to make this an, a really intensely, in, additional to, in addition to being a communal moment, it's a very intense personal moment. Um, it says the ministers may receive communion either before or after the people. Lamb of God, or in Latin, Agnus Dei, is very customarily sung at this time. Um, by tradition, it's sung right uh, just before the communion is distributed. In fact, sometimes Lamb of God is called the fraction, fraction meaning breaking apart, and mm -hmm. Lamb of God mm -hmm. is sung at the moment the bread is broken. Um, in, as it says here, it's, it's more flexible. It can be sung at that moment. It can be sung any time during the distribution of communion. It can be completely left out. It's a May rubric for Lamb of God. My glasses on or I lose my uh, uh, notes. After Lamb of God, assembly song and other music may accompany the communion. Um, I, I have fellow music directors who absolutely insist that the congregation should sing while they're waiting to receive communion during this time. My personal, we do. You do? Mm -hmm. My personal experience over 30 years of doing this is that people have a hard time with singing while walking, while, I mean, some of them are eating at the same time, especially at the 830 service when it's not a very large number of people. Half of the people are up in front already. Half of the people are standing in line. There's three people left in the pews. I find singing just really difficult at this time. So um, we do sing some things. We often sing little Teze pieces that are memorizable and repeatable. Sometimes our choir sings. Sometimes I'll just play something on one of the keyboard instruments. Um, but so that's the description, as it says in the book, assembly song and other music may accompany the communion. And it can be lots of different things. Um, after that, after all have returned to their places, the assembly stands and the president may say a table blessing. And this is um, it's pretty traditional in a lot of places. It goes, um, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Is the one I have in my head from childhood. 
Um, again, that's customary in some churches and not in others. Um, one could say the whole communion itself is already a blessing. Um, and we're also about to have a final blessing over on the next page. So um, some might see a blessing at this point as being extraneous. The assembly may sing, now, Lord, you let your servant depart in peace, which is the nunc dimittis. Um, that is, it's unique to Lutheran tradition, but it's really quite big in Lutheran tradition and has been since the 16th century. There are lots of other things that are not mentioned anywhere here in the book, like what kind of bread, what kind of drink, should there be options for different people? Um, somebody coming in. So more and more as we've become sensitive to people's dietary needs, uh, gluten-free bread as an option has become more common. Um, for a long time, there's been the practice of providing grape juice as an alternative to wine. Um, the, the real theology between the bread and the wine is that both the bread and the wine are complete in themselves. And if there's someone who can't have bread or can't have wine, we, the church, are required to offer both of those items. But the people who are receiving get the full effect of the sacrament if they only take one or the other of those items. So there's, there's interesting things. Like I've seen communion turn into a buffet where there's like eight different choices, and it gets a little unwieldy. Um, but it is nice to always have people's concerns. Um, when thinking about gluten-free bread, I often say, why don't we just serve gluten-free bread to everybody? <laughs> and then you wouldn't have to, yeah. have, to have the option. I think that's what um, the old wafers were because I'm certain they were made of rice. The, the wafers are wheat wafers, but um, go back to the wafers. You, could, you, can don't <laughs> wafer. you can get wafers with that are gluten free too. We have both. special wafers. Can. You can. Joan, did you want to say something? Yeah. They are awful. I have it up at a 30. So jo Joyce, I don't think you ever had the privilege of having anything prepared by Gretchen. I come out of a family of five Lutheran pastors and I had to come all Germany, all the way to California to have good communion bread for the first time <laughs> in my life. Okay. I have had the worst ever back in Germany, so I'm not going back. <laughs> yeah, we have. But, um, during Easter, we make our own. But. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We're very lucky at Grace, as Dan just said, to have absolutely delicious communion bread. Um, and one, a couple of times I have thrown out this idea to Gretchen of trying to come up with a gluten-free bread recipe so we wouldn't have to have kind of special bread for the gluten-free people. Um, and Gretchen says, no, my bread recipe is sacred. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're having the bread the way I make it, which is, is fine. I think we've come to a pretty good compromise here. Um, you know, Tim, the Roman Catholic Church a couple of years ago re revisited that and decided that you could not use gluten-free bread because wheat was absolutely essential. That, so these are these are arguments that go on in all different denominations. Like, is is wheat absolutely essential? Others will argue, really, you should use whatever is local to where you are. And perhaps in Asia, you might use rice cakes or anything like this. Um, so does it need to be wheat? People debate whether it must be unleavened bread or if leavening. Is. Yes. So there's there's all kinds of debate about that. My, my point with all of this is just to say the book doesn't dictate any of this. Um, so we won't find it. Um, also, things like do we stand to receive? Do we kneel to receive? In some congregations, people even just stay in their pew and it's brought to you. So, and again, the book doesn't describe any of this. Of course, you can also go on at great length about should there be a single common cup that we all drink from, or should all the little cups be pre-filled ahead of time, or kind of the compromise between the two is you have a common cup, which is consecrated, and this is what we do at Grace, and then pour from that large cup into the smaller that's, cups. That's what we do too. Means of distribution. 
Um, there's also intinction, which um, people seem to prefer because they think it's healthier. Um, but the honest truth to that is people's hands are much dirtier than their mouths are. <laughs> and yes. intinction is really kind of gross. So, um, but anyway, all of that's stuff that might, needs to be thought about separately from the liturgy. They're completely different issues. Kim, yes. I'm going to try again. Um, I'm interested, this is sort of um, a history question, but this thing about that you have to have an ordained minister to oh. have communion, I personally find that off-putting because obviously, historically, there was no such thing as ordained ministers. And I, I've been with groups where we commune each other. And I just wondered if there's some sort of, uh, if you have any background on that. Yeah, I mean, so you, I mean, you're really getting into like before the medieval period when we don't know if there was any such thing as ordination. I mean, there, there have been ordained ministers since at least the fourth century, I think. Um, so you're going way back before that. And of course, the, the Catholic practice is definitely it must be a priest at all times. The priest actually has this sort of sacrificial function. Um, and there, there's a special holiness that they receive in their ordination. And, and Lutherans don't believe that. But what the reformers would have said was for the sake of good order in the church, we appoint people to effect the sacraments for us. Um, so like, not just anybody can get up and have a communion service on their own. I mean, this is debatable, um, but sort of the, the historical perspective would be Lutherans have preserved a clergy for the sake of good order. Um, I think there's also a little bit of difference between having the ordained minister who prepares the table and says the words of institution, and then do you insist that the pastor then must give the sacrament to the people, or as you do at Unilu, can the people pass the sacrament from one to another? Um, I think those are kind of different issues. Um, there, there are people who would say you can't even receive the bread from anyone other than the hand of the pastor. Um, and I think that's, that goes a little bit far. Um, but I think the idea that there is a single person in your community who is appointed to be the person that oversees the sacrament makes some sense. Um, in, in ours, it depends on who the bishop is, right? Then it... Yeah, yeah. So normally the... Um, I think actually the ELCA rule is if you want anyone other than a pastor to give the sacrament, the bishop has to approve that. Right. And and the various bishops have their own thinking about it. So some bishops will say, absolutely not. You must have an ordained minister. And some bishops will say, if your pastor is gone, just feel free to pick somebody else to do it. So there's a whole there's a spectrum around that. Yep. In order to well, the, in our group, they won't even let deacons give serve communion. Yeah. I mean, up by her, by his or herself. Yeah. Right. So, all that is to say, there's lots to talk about that isn't yeah. in the book. So now we have reached page one one four. We finished distributing. And you can see that the, um, the assisting minister says a prayer following communion. There are three yeah. options here. Um, earlier in the book where we just had those pages and pages filled with prayers, there are five other options. Some of them are seasonal. And this is a, again a place where you can come up with words from elsewhere. You can find additional texts online. If you have a particularly literarily, literarily inclined person in your church, they can write the prayers. Um, but here in the book, we have three right here and five others in another place. And that communion is done. We've reached the sending ritual, which is the fastest bit. There's not too much else. But look under sending. The very first instruction is communion ministers may be sent to take the sacrament to those who are absent. This is something that churches do sort of off and on if they have people at home. And guess what? We've discovered this year, everybody's at home. 
And yeah. the solution to getting communion to people at Grace for this year has been that about one Sunday a month, we are going to, we have been taking communion mm -hmm. to people's houses. Normally, this is for someone who's in the hospital or is otherwise homebound and can't come to church. In this case, none of us can come to church. Um, we use a prayer, again, in the prayers earlier in the book, there is a prayer for sending communion to the homebound. And that's what we've been, the prayer that we've been using over the past several months is the prayer for distributing communion to the homebound. And then also interesting, interestingly right here, brief announcements may be made. This is the only place in the book where it is suggested to have the announcements. Um, and that's unusual because that's not actually common practice in a lot of churches to have the announcements right before the very end. Um, but this, this is where the book suggests that you might do that. And then it suggests that you might use a little short liturgy called the Affirmation of Christian Vocation, which we won't take the time to go back and look at right now, but that's a suggestion there. Then we have a final blessing. In some places, this is called the benediction. Um, we we kind of don't use the term benediction anymore for two reasons. One is blessing is just a more ordinary word that's easier to understand people. Benediction just sounds kind of jargony in some ways. Also, in some other denominations, benediction means something completely different that is not this. And um, just to kind of prevent ecumenical confusion, we've simplified it for this book to blessing. And they give you three forms here. The most basic is just Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Just a one final blessing from the Holy Trinity. The Lord bless you and keep you is actually from the book of Numbers, sometimes it's called the Aaronic benediction because the prophet Aaron says it in the book of Numbers. Martin Luther particularly liked this one. So that's uh, got a long Lutheran tradition behind it. And the third one up at the top of page 115 is just sort of a threefold fancier one. And again, you can have a locally written one if you want to. If you didn't already sing, now, Lord, you let your servant go in peace, you can do that next, or you can have a hymn, which is probably more common and what we do at Grace. And finally, the assisting minister sends the assembly into mission. Um, I really kind of like that line, that it's not just y'all go home now, but it's you, we all have work to do for this coming week and you are sent into your mission as a Christian in the world at this moment. And look at that, we finished. Yeah, Dan. So this is going to be a very strange and, and pedantic question. My but favorite at one. <laughs> genetic for me, so it's okay. But um, at what time is the service actually concluded? Is it with the blessing by the pastor, the last song, the moment you step out of the building? I occasionally try to remind my kids just because Pastor Matt raised his hands and saying, go in peace, that's not an invitation to run around screaming because everybody is still in the sanctuary and we kind of pile out quietly. And then there's coffee hour and that's still in church. They can really just only start screaming once they're actually out of the building. So when when are we actually done done? So so you're wanting a tip for how to control your children? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think again, this is something that different congregations work with in different ways. Um, I know at First Lutheran, where where you used to go, Dan, it's um, the tradition is that people sit back down and listen to the organ music at the end of the sermon yeah. and nobody gets up until the organ music is over and, and julie likes that idea um i think grace Jim? what's that i said are you envious <laughs> sometimes i'm envious I'll bet part, you of are. Says, yeah. part of me says go in peace means go in peace like you're done oh. at that point you don't have to listen to mm -hmm. me feel free to go um maybe it would be nice if people left a little quietly so the people who wanted to hear the music could stay and hear it but i don't feel like people should be required to stay and hear it um i also feel like you know we have a moderately informal culture 
um, where so often, you know, the pastor will make an announcement right before the very end, like, don't forget to do something, something on your way out. And, and that kind of, I, I'm not making a value judgment, but that kind of changes the mood right there from a worship yeah. mood into we're starting to think about outside of church now. So, you know, different, different congregations come to that conclusion in different ways. And I don't think I have a good answer for you, Dan. If, if you want your kids to behave until you get back home. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think that is the answer. Um, <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's the same thing with, you know, Grace is a very friendly congregation and they chat at the beginning of church right up until the moment we're actually singing the first hymn. Yeah, we do too. So, um, and actually, this is a funny thing. So I have gotten so used to quite a bit of chatter while I play organ music that when we went into pandemic and live streaming with no one here and it was completely silent, I was so Ooh. much more nervous than I ever am normally because it's like, oh my gosh, people might be listening now. <laughs> if you make and a mistake, they'll hear it. <laughs> they'll notice if I make a mistake. Yeah. And when they're all here, nobody knows. I mean, yeah, they're not paying attention, but also they're not noticing the problem. <laughs> so, um, maybe somewhere in between would be nice. Like, oh my word! <laughs> but I, I don't have a good, I don't have a good answer to when is the service over. But I do feel like theologically, go in peace is really it. Like, then you're free to go. So I, the next thing that I said we would do is actually sing through a little of the music of each of the 10 settings. So you can see the great variety of musical style that we have in the book. We can't possibly sing everything, but I thought what we might do is sing Holy, 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 the Sanctus from each of the settings, just as a short musical example. I'm gonna turn your microphones off while we do this. Um, Good. If, if you, especially if you choose to sing along, it'll make a mess. Um, but even without you singing along, there's a lot of background noise. So um, I'll talk, I'll sing, I'll turn your mics off, and we'll talk about them again when, we're, when we've gone through the 10. So um, the first one is actually on page 108. If I can figure out how to turn that on. That's mute myself. I don't want to do that. I think it's in participants. Yeah, I just found it. There we go. Okay. You're all off. Setting one is a composite setting, meaning it was written by several different people. In this case, this setting was written for this book. Um, the three people who contributed musical pieces to it are Tom Pavlechko, Mark Mummert, and Bob Farley. Uh, because this book is fairly new, I actually know personally all three of them, which is, I think, really cool and adds something. This would be considered the, the primary setting of this book as setting one. And here is how Holy 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 goes. <laughs> down for next time I use that organ. Setting two, the Holy Holy, is found on page 130. Setting two was written by Marty Haugen, who's a really well-known composer um, in the United States, particularly has written wonderful liturgical music. This particular setting was written, again, specifically for this book. I have, I don't, I've been meaning to confirm this with someone who might be in the know. What I think happened was they probably wanted to use a pre-existing setting of Marty Haugen's 
And because the copyright holder is a different publishing house, they weren't able to get the copyright for an existing setting. So they just had Marty write a new one. And so this is Marty Haugen's setting two. It works pretty well, I think, with both the organ and the piano. And I can't play it if I don't turn to it. I have this, you'll be interested in this great big wide book that has the piano and the organ music for everything. So I don't have to invent the chords using your book. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. As we go into setting three, what you might notice just as you're starting to turn forward is that a lot of the detail in the service is not reprinted. So in former hymnals, you used to be able to just turn to the first page of the setting and follow straight through from the beginning of the service to the end. And you can use this book in that way with setting one and with setting two. For all the rest of them, basically just a bare outline of the service is given and the music. So this created physical page space for a lot more music, but in some ways it makes the book a little bit less useful when you're just holding it in your hand. Um, however, the trend already for the past 20 years or so has been in most congregations, local production of worship materials. So tons, not in Palo Alto, but countless churches in this country now project the service up onto the wall onto a screen. Lots of others do exactly what we do, which is basically print out a new bulletin for every week that just has the items we're using that week. So actually fewer and fewer congregations are needing to turn to the first page of a setting and just go straight through. This actually creates a lot of flexibility. For example, if, um, well, it allows you to sort of not show stuff that you're not using if you're printing in a bulletin, or put in something extra if you wish to add something. For me as a musician, it has allowed the opportunity to mix and match stuff. So I sometimes, in fact, even right now, in the season we're in, we're doing the gospel acclamation out of setting six, and we're singing glory to God in the highest out of setting nine. And because we print a bulletin with just the stuff we want to use, I can do that and um, it works perfectly well. So, um, and, and just another little side comment, when all the way back in 1998, when they started talking about creating a new worship resource, there was even some question as to whether there would be a book. The, um, the trend already in the late 90s was towards either projecting stuff on screens or printing your own bulletins. And they asked themselves the question, would enough people even buy the books to make it worth printing a book? Um, as it turns out, they did decide to print books and I'm glad they decided to print books. Um, but that's, as we go forward now, you'll see these musical settings are basically just the music without all the prayers, without all the instructions. It's just not there. So setting three, um, you will find the Holy Holy on page 144. This setting was made by a man named Richard Hillert. He taught at Concordia University in River Forest, Illinois. Um, and he actually wrote this setting for the Green Book, the one that came before this. So you'll probably recognize having sung it for many decades of your life. I'm gonna go back to organ just for fun. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Holy, 
Some composers, and you'll see another example in a little bit here, they put the very highest note of the liturgy at what they consider to be the very highest theological point. So right at the moment we're about to consecrate the bread and wine to become the body and blood of Christ, we sing, Hosanna in that high note happens at the most important moment of the whole service. Um, and there's another setting that does that in a little bit here. Setting four has its holy holy on page 153. This setting was written by Ronald Nelson, who was a church musician in the Minneapolis area. Interestingly, this Holy Holy is much older than the setting. Um, there's um, Bach himself actually harmonized this Holy Holy. And so it goes way back to probably, I'm guessing the 17th century, um, and may even be based on a Gregorian chant tune, I'm not really sure. But Ronald Nelson made the whole setting and incorporated this historic Sanctus into his setting. This also was in the Green Book. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the Setting five, you'll find the Holy Holy on page 162. Setting five is a Gregorian chant setting. It was the third setting in um, the Green Book, and it also appeared first in the Red Book that came before the Green Book, the Service Book and Hymnal. It's chant, it's meant to be sung just as the simple melodic line all by itself. And I've actually trained the Grace Congregation to sing these chants completely a cappella with no accompaniment, which is how Gregorian chant would historically have been. Um, when the service book and hymnal was published in 1958, a woman named Regina Frixell made organ accompaniments to go with the chants. So there is an organ accompaniment, which I will use right now. Um, but think of this as really our oldest setting because it's a chant setting. a lot and actually I love listening to people sing that without any accompaniment at all. Setting six we'll go to page 173. 
This is a gospel setting uh, written in African-American gospel style. The Sanctus was written by a man named Tillis Butler, who originally included it in his Detroit Folk Mass. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the So quite different from setting five. Your next one is page 181. And this is our Spanish language setting. So the Sanctus itself is anonymous, uh, but the whole setting was written in a Latin American Spanish style. You can sing it either in Spanish or in English and I think I'm going to have more success personally with English right now. Holy, holy, holy Lord God, God of might and power, holy is the Lord. Holy, 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 holy Lord God, God of might and power, holy is the Lord. Hosanna here on earth, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna here on earth, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And setting eight, you'll find the holy on page 190. This is interesting. This is a composite setting by several different people in a contemporary style intended for congregations who have praise bands. As it turns out, most congregations who have praise bands do not use this book at all. They find the very idea of a liturgical hymnal to be not contemporary. So, so they don't, they're not using this. Um, some congregations have have found this useful, um, but I think probably not all that much. And I personally think, because I sort of know that congregations who have bands don't want to use the book, they, they needn't have used up page space in the book for stuff like this. Um, but this is actually kind of pretty, and I've made a nice electric piano sound for you because I think it fits with it. Holy, 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 actually think that's quite pretty, um, but very different style. Yeah, Joan likes it. Um, setting nine, the holy is on page 200. <laughs> this is 
This was written by a man named Joel Martinson, I think um, probably the youngest composer represented in this book, although he's in his 50s. Um, it was written for this book and works equally well with either piano or organ, I think. It's kind of loud. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power. This is the other one I was talking about, where he's put the highest note in his musical setting at the high point of the liturgy. So, um, just fun to notice that. Our last one, setting 10, um, the holy is on page 207. Setting 10 has put the words of the liturgy to the tunes of familiar hymns. Uh, it's a great one to use in the summer when you need something kind of more simple. You're, you have fewer people around, no choir. It's kind of great to use this one that's just entirely based on familiar hymns. The hymn that's used for the Holy Holy is Land of Rest, which we know as Jerusalem, our My Happy Home, which is a 19th century American tune. So that's um, one little snippet from all 10. If you want to jump back in with your microphone and you can reflect on that in any way you want to, or if you would like to choose a favorite, you're welcome to do that. Um, what, what do you think? I, I find some of them much more emotionally engaging. I mean, throw in a few, um, minors or something minor keys mm -hmm. or this last one i guess part of it is hard to take away from our history of how much we've used them yeah uh, very sentimental mm -hmm. yeah we like the ones that we have known the longest or have used the most or maybe we associate them with particular times um, Jan says, I don't think we've ever used seven and eight at Grace, and you are correct, Jan. We have never used seven or eight. Um, I don't think we've used six either at Grace, um, but we have used all the rest at some point. I, I kind of think you need to limit how many you use. I think with these pieces of the liturgy, I always say I don't necessarily think people should have them memorized, but I think people, as Joan was saying, should know them well enough that they trigger something in you. Um, six was the African-American one, Jan. I can, I can play it again if you'd like me to. <laughs> so um, they may show up at some point time. I think I, I mentioned a few minutes ago, we're using, because we're not having communion every week right now, so we're not using a holy at all. But um, the gospel acclamation that I am doing right now for January and February is from setting six, the African-American setting. 
kind of both having in mind that this Sunday is Martin Luther King Day, and then February is Black History Month. So just making some little connections there. Tim, I just want to mention um, your idea of which uh, versions are used. We had a change in ministers several years ago, way before Greg, mm -hmm. and he said, we don't use this stuff where I came from. And he wanted to get rid of a bunch of settings. There was like a war that happened in the church for a short period of time. You can't just throw out our, our sentimental favorites. But people have strong preferences. And I just think there's a lot of history there. Yeah, there, there are people out there, pastors and congregation members alike. I don't think we have any at Grace, but there are people out there who really insist that there should be one setting and one setting only, that your congregation always sings. Um, and honestly, I remember as a child before the green, so I was 10 when we went from the old red book to the green book. And what I actually remember is with the old red book, we only ever used one setting. It had two in it and we only used one. And none of the adults ever cracked the book. They would, they would take the book from the rack to sing the hymns, but nobody looked at the book to sing the liturgy because we always sang the same liturgy. And then when the green book came out, the settings were brand new settings that they'd never sung before. And then I remember everybody holding the book for the whole service. And that was kind of a new thing. Um, so as I said a minute ago, there's really something to be said for having it so ingrained in people's lives that, that they can cling to it and treasure it. On the other hand, it can become old and musty and you stop paying attention to it. So always that balance. We have just a couple of minutes left and to do with, for that, I, I wanna go forward now to page 210 and just talk very briefly about the next item in the book, which is the service of the word. The little introductory statement says most of what needs to be said about the service of the word. The service of the word derives its pattern from the service of Holy Communion. Although a weekly celebration of the Lord's Supper is the norm, a service of the word is also celebrated occasion regularly or occasionally in many places. And we here at Grace never thought we would ever have any need for the service of the word. And guess what we do all the time right now? Um, it's been the service of the word since March. The service of the word is structured just like Holy Communion, except when you reach the point where normally the bread and wine would be brought out. We have a thanksgiving for the word, and then we go home. This is very familiar to people who grew up in congregations that didn't celebrate weekly communion. The service of the word was, for many people for many centuries, decades to centuries, was the normal pattern. And we've recovered Holy Communion in the past few decades. And now the service of the word is, it's here in case you need it, but we're kind of assuming you're not going to use it on a regular basis. But here we are, we found ourselves in a situation where we really kind of do need it. The third paragraph on page 210 mentions any of the 10 settings may be used for the service of the word. And that's what we've done. We've kind of mixed and matched things just like a normal Sunday. There's a few more musical options here in the service, but um, you can use anything to replace just as you might want to page through. Um, you'll see the confession and forgiveness. You see a Kyrie, you see a glory to God, you keep on going, you see a gospel acclamation, just like Holy Communion. On page 219, at the offering, there's something they call a canticle of thanksgiving. And the instruction says the assembly may sing this canticle or another appropriate song. And I have just chosen a hymn to put in this spot instead of this specific canticle of thanksgiving. On page 220, you see the thanksgiving for the word. This is where we sort of are gonna just end the service because we're not having communion. There's a longer form and a shorter form. We used this longer form 
for the spring, we uh, simplified to use just the shorter little boxed gray paragraph during the summer. In the fall, we returned to the longer form again. And then the ELCA has realized that congregations are using the service of the word as their primary worship resource right now. And the ELCA has now issued a set of seasonal thanksgivings for the word. So um, we did, and they made it available online. So we did a specific Advent one, we did a specific Christmas one, and now we have just started a specific one for the season after Epiphany. Um, there will be a Lent one, there will be an Easter one. God willing, at some point this year, we're gonna get back to Holy Communion. Um, but in the meantime, we have a bunch of different thanksgivings for the word that we can play with. Then this service, ends after the Lord's Prayer, a, a blessing and a dismissal, um, just like, again, like Holy Communion does. Once we have finished page 222, and I timed this exactly perfectly tonight, we reach another beautiful painting that indicates we're about to go into the next major section of the book, which is um, the Liturgy for Holy Baptism and some other rites that are related to Holy Baptism. So um, we'll talk um, in two weeks again. Uh, we'll start looking at this painting, which I think is beautiful and fascinating in its symbolism. We'll do the baptism stuff. And then I don't even remember what comes next, but I think baptism won't take us the whole time. So we'll move on to whatever comes after that as well. That's where we are. Thank you. Thank you. We have yeah. coffee for on Sunday. Dan is eating coffee hour on Sunday, so coffee. come to the Zoom yeah. coffee hour. And my children, we'll check on your coffee. I can't wait. That was good. I, I enjoyed <laughs> seeing Jacob's giant Lego construction last Sunday. Well, we'll come up with something. Okay, um, we'll um, make it entertaining. Excellent. Sounds um, good. I'm looking forward to that. Thanks, Tim. Good. Thank, thank you, Tim. I think that uh, playing the different Holy Holies back to back was really eye opening. I really got a kick out of that. Oh, good. I'm glad you enjoyed that. I thought we should finally sing something since we're in a hymnal and all. So we'll, we'll do more of that as we go. I'm, I'm just checking to see if there's any other things that Jan asked and she's so good at using the chat. Do other melodies in the settings match the things we heard? Some settings are very cohesive. So you'll hear the same melodies kind of, or the same themes repeat themselves throughout the setting. Others don't do that. It really kind of varies um, based on what that composer had in mind. And Cecilia never liked the Green Book. Well, she wasn't alone. <laughs> and I say hello back to Jeffrey. Nice to, nice to see everybody. Have a good night. I can keep talking if you want me to, but I, we're ready to go. Thank you. Yep. See you later. Two weeks. Okay. See you on Sunday. Bye. So, what was the one that was?